Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Mesh Tsunami podcast. This week, we are offering five conversations from episode 13, our preview of Global Fatty Liver Day 2023 from Global Liver Institute, with Jeff McIntyre, Mike Patel, Louise Campbell, and me, plus from The Vault, a look back at our wrap-up coverage of International Mesh Day 2023. Jeff McIntyre uses the discussion between Louise Campbell and Mike Patel, which he describes as, quote, a really great synopsis, end of quote, of the challenges and barriers to patient diagnosis and care. He reports that the Global Liver Institute is planning to release its first best practices in liver health policy report. For GLI, these challenges are more complex due to the need to find solutions that will work in countries around the world. He also states that GLI believes the system needs to be intentional, not only about diagnosis, but also about health system follow through and overall patient management. I raised the issue of having safe spaces for people to exercise in less developed countries as one example of how social determinants of health play a key role in these issues. Louise Campbell recommends tier systems so that the solution for each country reflects that country's economics. I cite an Another social determinants issue, a recent study showing a link for U.S. Latinx population between food insufficiency in four-year-olds and muscle and mash later in childhood. Jeff describes the Stockdale paradox. Policymakers cannot get caught up in the big picture without dealing with the short-term issues ahead of longer-term successes. The rest of the discussion centers around more examples where public policy issues might get in the way of good health-related policy. Global Fatty Liver Day, the event previously known as International Nash Day, is the preeminent patient advocacy event on every year's calendar. This conversation whets our appetite for this year's event. So just sit back, listen, learn, enjoy. And when you're done, join the dialogue in our LinkedIn discussion group. Jeff McIntyre. It's so interesting to hear this conversation because I feel like what Louise and Michael have just done is give a really great synopsis to challenges and barriers for patients to get diagnosed and get care. And I'm thinking now also about, if you will, the back end of that, that once there has been diagnosis and care, how do we then prep for better patient access globally, not just in terms of diagnostics, but in terms of treatment, in terms of medication, kind of in terms of a, a solution for every stage, if you will. And that seems to me to be where the real power of Global Fatty Liver Day can be, is to have that coordinated global sort of messaging around this. And so we're getting ready to release our very first best practices and liver health policy report in Geneva uh, in coordination with the uh, WHO's World Health assembly. And in that, one of the things that we do is we take a look at, well, what has worked well in, say, the Philippines? Could we transpose that to Ecuador? We know that there are things that have worked really well in India, for instance, and Egypt. And so what are the lessons learned we can do that? And so we've got to be able to be intentional about both sides of this, you know, that it's not just diagnosis, but also ensuring that there is follow through, that there's patient access, that we have kind of the system and each of the countries set up for success down the road as we see things like medication and better research and science on diet and physical activity. We need to have that kind of holistic global attitude because as Louise mentioned, if this ends up just being sort of a compartmentalized sort of thing, then I don't know that we've done a lot of good on this. You know, if we only can do this for folks that can pay out of pocket and can afford the personal trainer, we haven't really addressed those most in need in the worst case scenarios on this. Roger Green. By the way, Chef, not either mo those most in need or most of those in need. It works either way. We're not going to hit anywhere near a significant proportion of the world's population that needs help. I mean, that's the first time we had Jeff Lazarus on here three years ago, maybe, one of the things that he was talking about in terms of sustainable uh, goals was the idea that people needed parks where they could walk, play, exercise, and feel safe. Yeah, absolutely. We tell people to exercise or, or, or physical activity and then put them in a lifestyle and an environment where they can't safely do that. You got it. You got it. There's so many variations of impacts that different different things can have on this. You know, I think I've often admittedly idolized, say, Scandinavian pedestrian infrastructure. You know, talk about a nerdy thing. They just, I feel like they've got their bicycling and their pedestrian infrastructure set up in ways that we dream of in North American city. You know, um, it would just be ideal. And we see that as like, oh my God, we could resolve so many things with that. But in so many of those countries, you introduce alcohol into the equation. And so they may not have the fatty liver numbers that the 
U.S. or that, you know, some of the other Western nations have outside of that. But once you address alcohol, which is a very particular, you know, characteristic for them, then you see those fatty liver numbers just go off the charts in that. And so there's some some good stuff we can we can we can learn from that, I think. Louise Campbell. Oh, I think you're right. It has to be a tier system. Some things will work in some countries. Some things won't work in countries. Most people affected are poor, low, middle income countries where they're not going to get access to these medications. They're not really going to get access to liver biopsy or any of the expensive tests. And they run such risks, particularly in these countries, that we need access to non-invasive technologies. So if you can change behaviour in Bangladesh, Rwanda, Kenya and places like that on non-invasive technologies and do the monitoring with little cartridges, small amount of blood, gives you what you need in countries that are high endemic for hepatitis and they drink alcohol, but they also have access to high sugar foods and Africa is now one of the fastest growing areas of full fatty liver. We still may not be on the scale of some of the concentrated populations that we talk about, Middle East, Hispanic, India and Asia, but there are countries in need where to be put on a medication for diabetes can send a family into poverty. Poverty in a family at that level means that you see tr- increase in child trafficking. You see all of the other social determinants. So we need to be protecting these people and these countries in sustainable ways with the use of the technologies that we've got. And I think that is one of the goals that I had with Towers and Health, that everybody should know their liver health because it can actually prevent things like that. And then we can talk about the Western nations with resmeteron, resdifera. But when that comes to Australia, we've got no way to detect it. Fibroscan was the one that was used, MRIF, MR, PDIFF and things like that. And we're, we've got access to those technologies. We need to build our systems better to support our populations. But the populations most in need going forward are the ones who can't get access to this. So I think it is a, it is a tiered system. So for you learning from these systems to be able to look it out is absolutely wonderful. But there are basics that we can all do. We can all have the same FIB4 test. We can all have those things. But if you forget an AST in the UK of a blood test, it costs you another £70 just to put that one test on against the £69 for all of the others together. If you put them together, it's just a no-brainer. Sad, but it's a no-brainer. I saw a study the other week that talked about the dramatic increase in childhood muscle and, and mesh around the world, really, but that one of the best predictors is food insufficiency. So exactly the people you're talking about, Louise, the ones who can't get access to the tests are the ones who are most likely to have the problem. They're most likely to have the problem because their diets don't support the kind of nutrition and health that makes it easy to get your calories in a healthy way. And if you drop on top of that system, the diabetes drug, all you've done is made the problem worse. There's a real web here, right? Louise reminded me of something. I find it poetic, frankly, at this point, because it is a thing that a year or two ago, I actually had a little bit of a reference with Stephen Harrison about, which is he and I talked about briefly. I asked him if he had ever heard of a thing called the Stockdale Paradox. And he had. He knew knew it well. And it's something that's taught quite often. And y'all may remember, uh, especially Roger and I as the two Americans, back in the day when Ross Perot ran for president, that he nominated for his vice president, somebody named James Stockdale, Admiral James Stockdale at the point. And there was a great viral moment back when viral was defined by being on the evening news of uh, Stockdale standing up at the podium for the vice presidential debate going, who am I? Why am I here? Nobody knows who I am. Stockdale, who which the Stockdale paradox is named after, was a prisoner of war in Vietnam, I believe, for roughly about seven years. And they asked him at one point, how do you do it? How do you keep going? And what was what was named is he said that you have to have a faith in the long term and the big picture that things are going to work out, that there is going to be a Stephen Harrison sort of optimism about what is going to happen. But the paradox of that is that you also have to get busy with the things right in front of you. And so you can't be just so caught up with the big picture that you just kind of think things are going to be okay without putting the work in on the immediate steps. And that's what comes to mind when Louise talks about kind of addressing these sort of things. I mean, we go very quickly from we need to get people screened from fatty liver disease to child trafficking. That's in many ways, we acknowledge the downstream impacts, but that's trying to boil the ocean when when the ocean is large and our boat is small. And so where can we direct that boat for the most impact in this in this moment. And that was the promise in the U.S. for the medication that came forth, that we could begin to have these battles. And we saw those battles behind the scenes happening. You know, we saw behind the scenes that when the VA came out with their draft prescription benefits manual, for instance, after uh, Rosdifra was approved, that they still required biopsy for diagnosis in their draft. 
And that was a problem. And so we, GLI, mobilized and got in touch with our friends on the Capitol Hill. They got in touch with people at the VA, and we were able to have that revised. But that's a great indication of, wow, if there had still been a loophole for biopsy that was necessary for diagnosis from a government agency that contradicted another government agency's kind of guidelines, then when we get our next therapy through and approved, then we still got that loophole that we've got to deal with. We just don't know where it's going to pop up as opposed to kind of this great way we're going to have. And I'll mention also finally here one thing that when we talk about, you know, the impact of, of nutrition, the impact of food, right now at the USDA here here in, in Washington, there is a consideration for revising the definition of the word healthy as to be used in packaging and as it applies to any food product that's given in the West. And we know that there's a huge trickle-down effect when it comes to other countries when the way it's done here. And there are companies, there are big, multinational, multi-billion, trillion-dollar companies that are actively lobbying and are on record of saying that added sugar needs to be a part of that definition. And they are making a, quote-unquote, scientific argument that added sugar sugar is actually good for you and good for children. And they're, they've got a lot of, a lot of weight that they're swinging in order to make this happen. And so big ocean, small boat, we're going to do the things right in front of us. Let's get people screened. It's interesting you say that. We ha- There was a big to-do in the UK not so long ago about children's teeth and access to dentists because the rate of decay in children's teeth is really high. Now, what we do know is that bad teeth, I think, confer a sevenfold increase in your risk of liver cancer because we are picking out people who have bad diets. And if we put liver diagnostics in every dentist, we would probably find the majority of our poor liver health. They're going to be looking at these children. They're wondering all of these different things. They come from the usual suspects, more lower socioeconomic areas with access to fast food on their doorstep. But this population of children now need to be followed through life for their liver concerns, their risk of diabetes, their heart disease. We've identified them. We've been giving them access to dental care and dietitians. We need to be doing a little bit more. But if we look at the common threads for most of our diseases, if we strengthen our nutrition education, if we strengthen our dietetics in hospitals and access to GPs, if we give them better counsellors, most of our diseases all run around the same needs. Rather than just keep it very siloed, this is my part of a dietitian. The dietitian could be wealthy across everybody's, and that's what we still see. It's a cardiovascular dietitian or it's diabetes and liver can't have access. We've got to break down those type of barriers to improve the care of everybody. But but I did a nutrition course. Fatty liver wasn't really mentioned. So we need to start at the education of nutritionists and dietetics. We need to talk fatty. We need to bring the liver. As I say, my phrase is we need to write liver back into the story of our health because wherever we've written it out, we have a serious problem. It's only going to increase unless we start to have that conversation. I totally agree. What scares me, Louise, is it sounds sometimes not unachievable, but where do we start? You know, it's easy to do something small. It's hard to do something as Jeff said, you got the whole ocean. Like we're so we're all like looking at each other, and going, "Okay, so like who's gonna who's going first? <laughs> it's <laughs> like that program like. drain the oceans. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what. You start small, not in hospitals. I had a friend who used to go, uh, who I worked with in the Royal Prince Alfred, and he did archaeology in his spare time. And he went to Angkor Wat, and they did a, a project where they just taught some of the villages to boil their water before they did the wound dressings and things like that, and basic hand hygiene. They cut diarrhea. They cut um, lots of spread diseases. They just taught something local that affected the women, the education of the children and the families in those villages, and it improved the health of those small communities. So sometimes we can look at a more local levels with something very simple to take ownership of if you've got a problem. At the moment, we're trying to change the world at a high level. High level never gets down to the ground floor. Trust me, I've worked in a hospital an awful long time to see that if you put the money in at the high level, I never see it where it affects patients. So I think we have to squeeze the lemon and is the juice worth the squeeze? And now, back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingmash.com. Next week, we'll celebrate Stephen Harrison with some of the key opinion leaders who knew him best. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now.